presentation of uh, the philosophical assumptions of, of the of the Powell doctrine. What, 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 tell us about this group. I mean, where 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 was the beehive of intellectual activity? Where did you do your writing? Was it in writing in journals? What? Uh, give us a sense of that. Well, first, Harry, let me say that I appreciate your your calling us a cohort instead of a cabal, which is what some <laughs> people right. call us. Well, they, well, at least I can do that's, it Berkeley. That's, that's right wing conspiracy. That's, that's right. right. That's, that's, right. Right. that's, that's right. right. That's right. Nowadays, you often read about the vast neocon conspiracy yeah, right. yeah. and for a conspiracy I think it's the most poorly disguised conspiracy of all time because it's so all, of it, all of its work has been in the public domain yeah, right. and especially associated with the Weekly Standard, a magazine that I'm now uh, proud to be associated with as well but a lot of the folks who have been clustered around that, that circle were warning uh, after the fall of Bill and Wall, that this was not a strategic pause, this was not a moment where we would have a holiday from history. That they were a lot of folks were warning about the great dangers that lay ahead, and that the only way to avoid those dangers was for America to take a real leadership role in the world, as we did post 1945. We could not retreat from the world as we did in 1919. We had to be actively engaged because if we retreated, we would suffer a terrible price. And I think that in a lot of ways, 9/11 showed the kind of price that we would suffer if we were not actively engaged even in distant lands like Afghanistan. So a lot of people were warning about this kind of thing going on uh, during the 1990s. Uh, two friends of mine, uh, Donald and Frederick Hagen, wrote a prescient book in 2000 called While America Sleeps, warning about these dangers ahead. And it was, it, it didn't get the attention it deserved because uh, we were still not wise to, to the threat that we faced. And as I say, I think 9-11 made people wake up and realize, hey, maybe these guys were onto something. Maybe there really is a danger out there. And I think it, it has alerted people to some of the things that, that, that people in this cohort or cabal uh, we're saying all along. And and was it was it the self confidence that came with the the fall of the the Soviet Union the 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 sense that the battle really wasn't over. Obviously the Soviets and communism were defeated, but but the the challenges would never cease. I mean, how important was that? I think there was a lot of that. There was you saw a real splintering on the right after the end of the Cold War. During the Cold War, a lot of these divisions had been papered over, but then after the Cold War, the question is what should be the foreign policy now? And you had a lot of different camps emerged. You had the libertarians uh, who were basically isolationists. You had uh, the old-fashioned right-wing isolationists like Pat Buchanan who were back to the days of Father Coughlin and the America yeah, First Committee. Exactly. Uh, all these trends that had disappeared on December 7th, 1941 yeah. came back with a vengeance after the fall of Berlin 1991. Wall. 1991. Yeah. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Right. It all came back. Uh, but there was a small group on the right that was arguing, no, our mission is not done just because communism collapsed doesn't mean that the world is now safe for democracy. Yeah. There are still dangers out there and the world can go to hell in a handbasket pretty fast if we don't take a leadership role. Mm -hmm. I think that was probably a minority view within the Republican Party for most of the 1990s. In fact, it may have been a minority view within the Bush administration uh, up until 9-11, but I think those attacks changed things very fundamentally in much the way that December 7th, 1941 changed everything. And, after, and, and, and in much the same way, I think both December 7th and 9-11 both woke people up to the dangers and made them realize isolationism is not an option. We have to be engaged because if we're not, we're going to suffer terrible consequences. As a, as a kind of an intellectual process I'm curious is, is to uh, to get a sense from you of, of kind of the intellectual excitement for the people who, who were kind of uh, doing this kind of writing at that time I mean you were still out in the woods so to speak I mean the country hadn't really embraced it uh, how, what was that play like I mean how, how did you 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 generate ideas among each other and and actually kind of elevate your your common consciousness of, of the dilemmas that we were in well I think there was you know like with any other group of like-minded people who are engaged in the same pursuit, there is a fair amount of uh, give and take and interaction. As I say, a lot of it in this case centered around the Weekly Standard. But it's it, you know it's like anybody else. I mean, if you have uh, a group of experts on Mayan pottery, they're going to exchange ideas on Mayan pottery and send emails to each other. And when an article on Mayan pottery appears in the New York Times, they'll email it around. And <laughs> we had pretty much the same phenomenon here sure. uh, dealing with these security issues. There aren't that many people who engage with these issues from uh, from this perspective, and and uh, we're not all very tighten it by any stretch of the imagination, but I think there's there's some back and forth. Um, and 
now some of the people who are engaged in that in the 1990s hold some senior positions in the administration, so they're able to articulate these views within the administration while uh, some of us are, are articulating them from the outside. Do you think uh, that uh, uh, our forces now are configured uh, to, to uh, fight the kind of engagements that are, are now required where, where I guess in, in your terms you, you would say that the American empire has to do uh, its business and meet its responsibilities? The thin green line on the, on the edge of empire protecting our interests while America sleeps. Um, I think our forces are, are, are pretty darn good, not only uh, the best in the world today, but obviously the most powerful in world history. That said, I mean, I think there are some areas of possible improvement. I think we're stretched very thin right now and will be stretched especially thin with that task of occupying Iraq, which is going to tie down probably two or three army divisions. I think the Marines, for example, need to step into the breach and get more involved in some of these nation-building activities that they've tried to get away from mm -hmm. in the last 50 years. I also think we need, probably need a somewhat larger force and also need to spend somewhat more on the military because we took a procurement holiday in the 1990s and our, our, our forces are out there with antiquated equipment in many cases. But all that said, I think we do have the most tremendously capable military in history and they've, they've done a tremendous job. They've shown that they can meet any challenge that they confront, and uh, I think Afghanistan was a particularly dramatic example of that because if you think back to uh, September and early October of 2001, if you listen to what the pundits were saying, all the talk was about quagmires and other Vietnam. This will be like the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Afghanistan is the graveyard of empires, the dreaded Afghan winter and all that kind of stuff. And I think in retrospect, it's obvious the Afghan winter was a lot like the winter in Key West. Uh, it wasn't that dreaded. And But more importantly, the American military showed they were capable of fighting uh, in a tremendously challenging environment and prevailing, uh, despite what all the uh, weight of pundit opinion was. And I think that's in general the case that if, if you let our force Forces use their initiative. If you set these these young 20-year-old uh, 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 junior officers and NCOs free to do what they can do, they will achieve amazing results. The only thing that can hold them back is uh, is is wrong-headed directions from uh, their commanders or from Washington. The day is the 11th of March, 2003. It's worth noting because this is a historical program. Before very many days have gone by, there is a very real likelihood that the United States troops will be in fact committed in Iraq. Is it going to be in fact the mother of all battles? Not from Saddam's perspective, but from ours. Is it in fact going to be the quintessential infantry battle of mobility? Is it going to be in fact much less reliant upon big blue 82s, 20,000 tons of stuff going into the ground, set the Set the, set the dial and you can get down to 55 feet, a little less, of course, 45 feet. A little less of all the high-tech targetry things that you were discussing a moment ago. And fundamentally, we'll get down to essentially platoon company and at most, perhaps, battalion level type operations in conceivably an urban environment. Well, first let me note that this is a dirty trick asking me, to, prognost <laughs> asking me to prognosticate about what happens no, 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 no. I'm just for asking people to... who are going to who are going to view it after the fact. <laughs> All right, I will. Sorry, Max. No, no, I will. We, we, we will edit out. The <laughs> oh, no, you won't. Oh, no, you won't. If, if I say anything bad, I hope that winds. <laughs> we don't that turns out to be ahead. incorrect. That winds up on the cutting room I'm floor. I'm not so much asking for no, no. Let me. But as it's sizing up, yeah. As you uh, see, what's well, you know, I, I, preparation. Look, I, I, it, it's all, it's obviously impossible to predict ahead of time exactly what shape the battle will take. I am confident that our forces will be victorious in relatively mm -hmm. short order. And I think for basically two reasons. One is our overwhelming technological advantage, which has only grown since the 1991 Gulf War. And the second is our tremendous uh, manpower and, or if you like, person power advantage, which is that we have these superbly trained troops yes. who are much more motivated, much more trained, and much more battle ready than anything the Iraqis can throw against them. And I think the combination of that yeah. will lead to overwhelming victory. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I have a, a question for you. We've talked about the forces and we, we've talked about uh, this uh, uh, group who, who thought about these problems in, in a 
period when it wasn't easy to talk about. Another key element comes in, which is our our commitment to the notion of, of the American ideal and how it can change the world, Wilsonianism in short. And and I'm 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 curious about your sense of the importance of that tradition as a resource both for our soldiers, for our leaders, and for uh, uh, resonating with the American people with regard uh, to that uh, mission. I think that's a tremendously important point to bring up, and that is in some ways the most potent weapon in our arsenal is the promise of freedom that American troops bring with them. And that is the reason why when American troops enter Paris, or they enter Pristina, or they enter Kabul, or shortly Baghdad, they are greeted as liberators, not as oppressors, because the people know that we do not come to establish an empire, we come to give them freedom. And that is a tremendously potent tool that we can use to the fullest, and I think we should use to the fullest, and any foreign policy that doesn't take advantage of that is not being truly, quote unquote, realistic, because there's a school of realpolitik foreign policy which eschews idealism and, and wants to concentrate on hard power, but I think that is very short-sighted because some of our most potent power is the power of our ideals. And I think that the most successful foreign policy presidents are those who can combine high ideals with an understanding of the power politics needed to implement them. And I'm thinking specifically of presidents like Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, Ronald Reagan, and I think George Bush is showing himself to be part of that tradition. One of your predecessors at Zimmet's lecture was Joe Nye, and he was particularly interested in getting across uh, the importance of soft power. The other, the real question that I'd put to you is how soft can the soft power get before it ceases to be power at all? I, I don't think there's a calculus, an exact one, but take, you know. You can exaggerate the impact of soft power. You know, Tom Friedman had this famous McDonald's theory of conflict yes. prevention, which is that according to him, no two nations with the McDonald's ever go to war with one another, which sounded great until 1999 when the U.S. and Serbia went to war. And you know what? They both had McDonald's. Mm -hmm. So there's limits to how much you can expect from Madonna and McDonald's mm -hmm. and all this other American, quote unquote, soft power mm -hmm. spreading around the world. That's ultimately not going to be the ultimate guarantor of our self of, of our national interest and security. I mean, people who think it is are falling prey to the same illusion that was prevalent before World War I when so many people thought that the growing interdependence of the world made war an impossibility. And clearly, if history shows anything, it shows that's not the case. I think we have to back up our soft power with hard power, and we need a lot of that hard power. And I think the reason why the soft power works, the reason why peaceful commerce takes place, the reason why we can have this interchange with the world is basically because America serves as the, ulti as the global policeman, that we are guaranteeing and underwriting a security of this world order. And it's the same way that normal commerce functions in any city in the world, in, in the United States. I mean, how does uh, Berkeley or New York or any other city function? You don't have to have omnipresent police power, but you have to have the threat of force in the background to make sure that peaceful people are not going to be set upon by predators, that the rules will be obeyed and people will, will, play, will, will follow the law. And you need to have some kind of force that guarantees that happens. And in the international sphere, very often, there's really no alternative to the United States as being that guarantor. So Is we're, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Please, no, please, please. So we're going to be Rudy Giuliani That's in New York. Year. Yes, okay. absolutely. How much of the small crime do we have to deal with in order to get rid of the big crime? In other words, what do we, you know, Why out there in this world, how about the guys who, who are cleaning your windshields and you don't want to be doing it? Yeah. Are you going to go after those guys to well, what extent? I, I'm not sure we need to worry about turnstile jumpers and Baghdad. Okay, but, all right, but you know what I mean. Yeah, no, I, I know, <laughs> you know what you have I'm to driving. worry about the stadium <laughs> right, in Baghdad. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, obviously you have to choose your, 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 your moments and, and pick your targets, and we don't have the resources to literally police the no. entire world the way that mm -hmm. the NYPD polices New York, but I think we certainly have to focus focus on the more egregious cases, uh, and, and we've seen some of them in the past decade in, uh, in places like Bosnia or, mm -hmm. or Kosovo or Afghanistan or Iraq or Rwanda, or I wish we'd done more to, to stop the slaughter. I think those are the kind of cases where there is a, 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 an overwhelming case for American intervention, whereas, you know, there's, there's going to be... Uh, petty wrongdoing or oppression going on in many countries that we just don't have the resources to address. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, was it the, getting back to this Wilsonian uh, motif, was it this, this younger cohort uh, of neoconservatives who revived that and brought it to center stage in, in the current Bush administration? 
Oh, maybe. I mean, I think the Wilsonian strand has always been very strong in American foreign mm -hmm. policy. I mean, I, people don't often think of him this way, but I really think that Ronald Reagan was one of our great Absolutely. Wilsonian presidents. Absolutely. He he championed these ideals and he talked about tear down that tear wall, down that wall mm -hmm. and champion Absolutely. human rights in the Soviet Union, did all these kinds of things, which turned out to be very powerful weapons in bringing down our adversaries in the Soviet Union. I think that strain was absent largely from the 